John, we've gotten to equal time. We've had Steve Cohn, the owner of the Mets, twice. We're coming through this time. The owner of the New York Yankees, Hal Steinbrenner, is joining us on the show. Yeah, I'm so glad that we have Hal Steinbrenner on the show. It'll be a real treat. Obviously, he's not a big talker like his dad was, like Steve Cohn is, but he's not competing in that way. He wants to win games, and he'll come on, and he'll have some things to say about uh, the Yankees' uh, first quarter of the season and anything else we may ask. And uh, just want to say it's uh, great to have him on. We're going to have some thoughts on the Yankees in the first quarter of the season, the Mets in the first quarter of the season, and the sport in the first quarter of the season. And, of course, as John mentioned, Hal Steinbrenner, if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John, it's uh, great to see your background. Great to see you. We weren't even going to have you this week. This is a vacation week. This is this is gamer Cal Ripken, Lou Gehrig style stuff. <laughs> Show up on your vacation to join us. I think I think it's more about the guest than me, right? It's the guest. Yes, it's yeah. all the guests. Not more. It's all about the guest. Yes, we have a, well, quite a good guest today. And uh, thank you for reaching out to him. And uh, I'm glad that he was able to do it. Yeah. Uh, John, we're about at the one quarter mark of this season, uh, 40 plus games uh, happens quick, right? You blink your eyes, you're in spring training. And here we are a quarter of the way into the season. And I wonder if we could kind of talk about the New York two teams a little bit, House time, British Yankees and the Mets. Why don't we start with the Mets just because they're very troubled right now. They're 20 and 22. They've got a minus 16 run differential. Is this a good team playing poorly or a bad team playing poorly? Yeah, I still think it's a pretty good team playing poorly. They're clearly playing poorly, though. I mean, if you look at the stats, they're worse than 20 and 22. And they've just come through a stretch where they're playing weak teams and losing to those teams and losing pretty badly. Uh, They were wallowed by Detroit. Last game against the Nats, they were not good at all. Uh, It has been a terrible stretch, but it's been a bad first quarter of the season for them. I mean... Looking at the offense, they're in the bottom third. Looking at the pitching, they're in the bottom third of that. So I think they're fortunate to be 20 and 22 right now. They're fortunate to be 20 and 22 to me, John. They're fortunate to be in the National League where there seems to be two really good teams in the Dodgers and Braves and then a real, uh, you know, group of eh. And they're in the group of eh, just to put a finer point on your point, John. They Detroit, Colorado, Cincinnati, Washington. That was supposed to be the soft touch that helped them build up their one loss record. Four and nine against that group. And I just wonder, just a little rant here, John, if you'll forgive it, which is you mentioned pitching and you mentioned hitting. But we just have this knee-jerk reaction to say this is a Buck Showalter team, that they're, they'll they play well technically. To me, they're not playing well technically. They've been terrible on the bases. They've committed the second most outs on the bases. Basis. That's not court stealings or pickoffs. That's like line drive, double plays, trying to take an extra base. They're tied for the second most in the sport. We saw another terrible one as we're talking today. Yesterday, Francisco Alvarez backpicked on a bases loaded situation against Washington. Daniel Vogelback, for some reason, wandering off the base against Colorado and getting backpicked by Chris Bryant. Brandon Nimmo, for some stupid reason, with the tying run at the plate in Detroit in the bottom of the ninth, making the last out. John, I think. I think Buck Showalter needs to make a statement here. By one time, one of these guys makes a mistake. He benches them for a little while to try to get it because they are not, you know, they're not going to be able to just throw the names in the payroll out there. They're going to actually have to win some of these games. Yeah, it's been shocking. In the last game, there was a fly ball at right center that could have been caught easily by Marte or Nimmo, not caught. Uh, they're just playing poorly, but the, the stats will tell you what they're doing right now. To me, the offense is really the, the shocking part of this because they really have not had a ton of injuries on offense. There's no reason they should be 23rd in runs scored. Uh, you know, they've got obviously Nimmo is a good player. Al- Alonzo's an outstanding slugger. Lindor is a very, very good hitter. McNeil's an outstanding hitter. Uh, you know, they brought up Beatty and, and Alvarez, and I think they should be good. Um should be a very good offensive team. To me, that's really the shocking thing more than anything. The pitching, they've had injuries. You know, obviously Scherzer's had a couple things go on. Verlander's been injured. Uh, come back, and he looks good. So that that's a big plus. we got to say something positive. That's a plus. <laughs> but, I mean, Carrasco was terrible before he got hurt. Quintana was hurt at the beginning. Peterson has been bad. I mean, right now, you know, the rotation that was ranked first is near the bottom. The, the bullpen is overtaxed. I don't blame them. The one guy who's really been great this year, I think, is Robertson. That's basically been it. I don't think anybody else has been great on the team. 
and many have been well below expectations. You know, John, I, it was a point I made last week, and I just think it's a, a worthwhile thing to keep hammering home. The Mets are minus 14 in home run differential. And I always just bring it up because the only sure way a run is scored is if you hit a home run or the other team hits a homer. It's at least one sure run. You don't need hits. You don't need good base running. And when you're losing that battle as distinctly as they are, just to put a finer point on it, the 10 teams that are negative in home run differential, the worst home run differentials, are all below 500 right now. It's it, it's a reflection that your pitchers are giving up too much slug and you aren't slugging enough. And I'm wondering where the Mets get this besides Pete Alonso. Is Lindor going to get to 30? Will Alvarez's uh, you know power play in the major leagues this year? Will Beatty's power play in the major leagues? I think it's a significant issue, especially if you're going to give away runs on the bases the way they are and not pitch well. Yeah, I mean, 41 home runs is 22nd. I mean, this has been a complaint of mine for a while. They, they were good last year, even with an average home run hitting team. Uh, you know, I think Alonzo is kind of, I don't want to say naked in the lineup. I, I think Beatty will be the guy who will be the solid number five guy. I think the short answer to this is that Beatty and Alvarez, are they're gonna, they need to rely on them. They need to depend on those two guys to be really good and to make this a good offense. Yeah, and this is completely different than the Yankees, right? Because the Yankees certainly have big power, fourth in home runs, 63. That's to be expected. You know, right now they're playing well. I think we were all worried about them when they were last place, even though they were it was a great last place. But uh, right now they're out of last place, and they look they look really good. I mean, to, to be to be playing the Rays pretty even that that's a big plus. And then the first game against the Jays was a big plus as well. They're playing better teams, and they're playing better against those better teams. Yeah, you know, John, just to combine the two as we transition over to the Yankees, uh, you know, I do think the Yankees are historically used to carrying a big payroll and all the expectations that come with it. Uh, the Mets are kind of like testing this a little bit for the first time. It's really the bullseye team in the whole sport. We're seeing them and the Padres, who are the bullseye teams. They're not performing well early in the season. And there is something to be said. Look, I, I know the detractors of the Yankees and Brian Cashman and Aaron Boone, where's the World Series, et cetera. They, they have never failed to contend in 30 years, finish over 500. There is something in their DNA. Like Clark Schmidt is pitching pitch for pitch as poorly as David Peterson. But the Yankees are overcoming it with kind of, is it more power? Is it a winning expectation? Their defense is very, very good. Volpe's a much better defensive player. It's funny, Volpe and uh, Alvarez are much better defensive players than right. their reputations yeah. so far. And I do see a path where the Yankee offense actually is going to be much better than it's been so far this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I understand what you're saying with bullseye teams, but let's not make that an excuse for the Mets. I don't think the Reds, the Rockies, the Nats, and the Tigers are saying, oh, we got to beat the Mets. You know, they're just trying to scrap. Well, I'm talking games. about carrying the weight. You know, I understand. I'm saying that it's, it's, right. it enthuses the other team or energizes the other team. I just wonder if the Mets are carrying the weight or the Padres are carrying the weight of, hey, you are you better win this year. Well, let's hope not. I, I, I hope not. They're professionals. Um, I, you know, I, the Yankees, to me, they look really good lately. I know their record really probably doesn't reflect that. Uh, the, the one negative there is they're in a little bit tougher spot. They're in the best division by far and the better league. Uh, it certainly looks in the American League like there are potentially nine or ten teams that are could be playoff worthy, whereas in the National League, I thought we had six teams to start. Uh, they're right now there are six different teams. We've got a lot of surprises, obviously, with the San Diego and St. Louis and the Mets not look and Philly not looking very good. But I think overall we have six good teams in the National League. We'll see how it shakes out. But in the American League, you know, I think and again, we're big Angels fans. We showed that last year. I think the Angels are above average. I think Seattle's good. Uh, Texas is probably not quite as good as they played, but they're they're a good team. Houston's better than they've played. Um you know, obviously the Central's weak, but, you know, to have two good divisions out of three and have by far the best division. I mean, that East is uh, playing 600 ball right now. They're, that's not very likely, and, it, you know, the, it reflects how good they are. You know, the, all five teams in the AL East, John, it, have a 500 or better record and a positive run differential. To your point, everyone but Oakland in the AL West, four teams – are over 500 with positive run differential. You want to add Minnesota. So we're talking about 10 teams for six spots. It's not close to that in the National League. It's the saving grace for the Mets. I'll say this after I was uh, at, I was at the Met Yankee game on Saturday, and I it was just the at-bats were so good by the Yankees. 
in that game, even when they weren't scoring. And again, you, I began to see the pathway where they're much better than they were for most of this first quarter of the season. Now, a part of it is, does LeMayu stay healthy? He's such a key guy. Does Volpe continue to grow? He's such a key guy. Judges back, stays healthy. Rizzo's been great. You know, Bader helps the lineup uh, down in that bottom third. I almost wonder, do they have to, uh, look, do they have to ditch literally Donaldson and Hicks? This is where we started the season, not bring it back at all. The team is just better, say, to me, when LeMayu and Cabrera are playing third base. Cabrera's at-bats have been much better for about 10 days now. I think he's a good, young, heady, high IQ player with a good engine. Maybe Jake Bowers is a little Matt Carpenter this year. The at-bats have been real good. It's just, I actually, the one thing I wonder about with the Yankees is the rotation. Will they ever have enough starters healthy at one time to kind of be all they can be? Well, I mean, Rodon has started throwing uh, flat ground, which is basically playing pass or having a catch, depending on where you're from, what you call that. But he's six weeks away. So we're looking at late June for him. I think Severino, they expect fairly soon. But, you know, he's had such an injury history, you really can't count on it. I'm amazed that they're, you know, doing as well as they are doing uh, in terms of preventing runs. They're in the top 10, I believe, ninth in ERA. I give Matt Blake, the pitching coach, credit. Um, Obviously, Schmidt has not panned out to this point. But uh, overall, their pitching has been good. They've gotten bullpen pieces that they didn't probably even they expect to be this good. One advantage I, I do think the Yankees have is that they do have Cole and Judge on the team. And Cole and Judge are two of the best 10 players in baseball, I think. Uh, You know, I know some people may differ on that, but uh, probably not with Judge. He's certainly, I would say, the best hitter right now. I guess somebody would argue for Soto now that he's hitting again, but uh, probably the best hitter in baseball. It's a huge advantage to have those two great players. Now, it hasn't done the Angels as much as we expected to have two great players, but I, I do think that's one big separator between the Yankees and the Mets. The Mets have a lot of good, very good players. I mean, Alonzo, Lindor, uh, McNeil, uh, they're terrific players. Nimmo, but Cole and Judge, to me, are two of the top 10 players in the game. And that, that that's a big help. Yeah, I think Cole nudges into the top 10 because at a position where there's no durability, you know you could wind yeah. him up. And he's going to start every five days. He's going to give you, on his worst day, he's going to give you some shot to win the game. And on his best day, he'll dominate. John, to wrap up the, the first segment here, why, why don't we, it's also the, obviously the one quarter mark for more than just the two New York teams. If I, I'll ask the broadest of possible questions here. What, what stood out to you in the first quarter of the season with three quarters to go? Yeah, I mean, maybe it was my bad predictions, but the shockingly bad performances by some teams. And now we'll throw the Mets in there although they're just a little bit under 500. And St. Louis has been terrible, though they've come on. The White Sox, abysmal, 14 and 28 as we do this. I don't think anybody was expecting that, looking at that talent, looking at that rotation. Uh, I know they took a big hit with Liam Hendricks going down. I'm so thankful that he's cancer-free, terrific individual now. But other than him, it's been a dreadful story for the White Sox. And obviously the Phillies have badly underperformed and the Padres as you mentioned earlier a big big payroll team not as big as the Mets uh underperforming to this point I I do expect the Padres the Phillies and maybe the Mets to come out of it St. Louis is in that good division for them I mean by good I mean bad division maybe they'll show something I think the White Sox are probably dead in the water right now but to me we have almost a half dozen teams that are shockingly mediocre to bad at this point yeah, you know, just on the Cardinal point, uh, you know, you you are really our listeners should know are really good with math odds. You how you you you've always I've been asking you to help me with math for thirty five years. Uh, like if I were asking you what is the win total that wins the NL Central, it to me I would guess eighty five, and no. I actually think St. Louis could get to eighty five as bad as they've played so far this year. So like it if you're it's like real estate, location, location, location. If you're in the right location, you know, if St. Louis is in the AL East, their season is already over. Uh, yeah, but in yeah. NL Central, it's going to be forgiving. My, If I were making a big point about this season, I, look, we started, we did so many shows early on, John, about the rules. The one big thing is working as well as they could hope, which is they've trimmed about 26 minutes off of a nine-inning game. Things move much quicker. And I think that makes the fact that the 
the three true outcomes are actually up this year more tolerable because at least it isn't drawn out. Uh, the walks, strikeouts, and homers are all up. I watched, I was at a game on Saturday, John, that was three hours and nine minutes. It was a Yankee Rays game. It was so well played. There was stolen bases. There were bun hits. There was great at bats, key pitching moments. It's everything that you hope baseball. And it was 309. In the old days, that game is four hours and you lose the drama and you lose so many of the good things. So as I'm just sitting here, just our ability to cut out fat has made some of the things we didn't even like about the game just more tolerable. Right. I mean, obviously, I was going to be in favor from the beginning because we have deadlines that we have to meet. and It makes it much easier for us. But putting that aside, the fans are really what this game is about. And I, I think trimming the fat out of the games has certainly helped the games uh, not hurt the games. I, I really don't think all that extra time was necessary. I know some old school people like the cat and mouse game late in the game. And maybe there'll be some adjustment for late in the game or playoffs or something because they're still willing to possibly do something different. But for now, I think it's been great. I, I really do. I think the new rules have been great. The more steals has been huge. I mean, certainly Volpe taking advantage of it. I don't think he hasn't been caught yet, but he's not the only one who's been able to steal almost at will. And I, I, I think adding that athleticism to the game with the shifts, I think is a big plus also. So the rules have been a huge benefit so far. Yeah. A more aesthetically pleasing game played at a better pace has been one of the real uh, joys of the first quarter of the season. Uh, we will talk more about the Yankees at the quarter season. Mark, uh, our special guest coming up next on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, is the owner of the New York Yankees, Hal Steinbrenner. Back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman and uh, John, it's not only a first that we have the Yankee owner, Hal Steinbrenner, on, but I'm going to corroborate this with Hal Steinbrenner. It's the first ever podcast he's ever done. So we both, John and I, feel honored that, A, you're with Thank us, you. and B, <laughs> this is your debut in podcasting, Hal. It is my debut. It's a good thing you told me how to do it and how to get on. <laughs> well, fingers crossed that we can make it to the finish line of this Uh uh, look, we're a quarter of the way into the season. Uh, we already know some things. You're in a very tough division. I just wonder, you've been doing this for a long while now. How do you begin to assess a team? Like, like do you wait till Memorial Day? Do you talk to Cashman and your baseball people? Do you talk to people? Is it all your eyesight? How do you decide what you have and how you feel about your baseball team? I look. I like. I was up in New York Tuesday and Wednesday last week, down in the clubhouse a lot. I mean, I meet with the meet with the Judge. I meet with Cole, uh, which we did a few weeks ago before my surgery. Um, I meet with coaches, Boone, Cash. Yes, I, I meet with everybody, the trainers, and so on and so forth. And um, when when do I really take a hard look at it? I, I'm probably not right in this, but I'm taking a hard look at it pretty much right away. Some other people would say, "Whoa, six month season," you know. Let, let's just see what we got the first month and two, and then you can start worrying if you're going to start worrying. But uh, I tend to do that a little bit quicker than others. Since you're assessing right from the start, uh, what's your assessment of the Yankees thus far? Well, look, you know, John, I don't like being in fourth place, but like Joel said, this is a, a very tough division. I think every team's above 500. Um, but having said all that, I mean, I, and I, I emailed this to you last week. I mean, I, given the fact that we have been playing with two thirds of our intended team pretty much the whole year, I think the guys have done a good job in hanging in there. I mean, this could have got away from us quickly on more than one occasion, and it didn't. And, you know, now they're starting to hit, a lot of them. Uh, they're starting to believe that they're never out of a game, no matter what the score is. I think we saw that Saturday. Great game. Um, and we're getting healthier. I mean, Sevy's pitching the second rehab game tonight. Kane Lee's pitching with uh, Tampa here uh, on Thursday with the Tarpons. And we got other guys following. So um, we need to... Limit the injuries from here on out. Get healthy, and uh, we're going to have a great team. We got a great team now. It's only going to get better. Let's not uh, uh, ignore the injuries because you mentioned it in the thing. You're playing hurt. You had some shoulder surgery recently, so we appreciate you playing hurt and coming on, uh, on the show. Hal, if I could stick with the the injury thing, yeah, you have had now a lot of injuries the last few years. I think of you as having a very kind of thoughtful, thorough mind. You know, you're a pilot. You're track weather, you're an MBA. Are you comfortable with the people in charge of your health, the protocols, et cetera? 
Yeah, Joe, as you know, a few years ago, we really looked at everything. And not only did we change personnel, uh, strength and conditioning wise, we changed a lot of techniques, a lot of the things we do in the weight room to get more up to date with what other professional sports and collegiate teams are doing. We brought on Cressy, who has a great reputation in the industry around the country, uh, the sports industry. And so I, we did a lot of things right. Uh, am I content with what's going on? No, I am not content with what's going on. And that's why in a couple of weeks, I'm going to sit down with Cressy, who's been working on a report, kind of looking at, you know, what injuries are like around the league, what injuries were like the last, you know, 10, 15 years in our organization, what's improved, what hasn't, what we can do better. Um, I'm on it. And, you know, you're perfectly right to ask those questions. And so are the fans, obviously. Um, and I'm perfectly right to ask those questions, too. And I have already. The biggest decision that you've made uh, in the last several months is bringing Aaron Judge back and signing him to the biggest free agent contract ever, $360 million. I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I know you guys were at 320 at that point, and to go up to the record number, I, I think you probably had to because the Giants were there, and who knows what the Padres were willing to do. What was that discussion like? Was there a some pushback, dissent? I'm sure there's always some devil's advocate advocacy going on there why did you decide to ultimately pull the trigger and give him the contract which i think was a reasonable deal i mean if you look at carlos correa signed for 350 or agreed at 350 million at one point judge was clearly the number one free agent out there so i don't think it was unreasonable but how did you come to that conclusion to do that deal and what was the discussion like yeah, I don't think there was much dissension, to be honest with you. Everybody, you know, we all know how important Aaron was to the organization. What a great leader. And, uh, you know, he really had a healthy, great, obviously, year last year and really stepped up his leadership in the clubhouse as well. And, I mean, everybody felt that, yes, we were in char uncharted waters with these type of numbers, without a doubt. Um, but, we, you know, we, we, we had a feeling we were not the only, uh, you know, fish in the pond here. And, you know, there were, clearly there were other teams involved. And, you know, my... I kind of told the story at the press conference, um, but, you know, my intuition just kicked in that we needed to have a couple conversations and that Cash and Paige were doing a great job. But, you know, at some point it's got to be the two of us. And, um, you know, I really wanted to know what was important to him, what what was going on, what was important to his family. And those are the conversations we have. And, and it's clear he felt like he was, you know, wanting the ninth year and, and would, uh, you know, continue to play well even past the ninth year. Um, but that was something that was important to him, among a few other things we talked about. So I, I don't recall, and this was a few months ago, I don't recall a lot of dissension internally that, no, we shouldn't do this because everybody knew and knows what he means to the organization. You know, Hal, just to stick on Judge and something you said earlier, you mentioned that when you were in New York last, you spoke to Cole and Judge. Is that a new thing where you're speaking with those two? And what are you trying to mine when you're talking to, well, I would assume you, you as the leader of your pitching group player wise and the leader of your position group and maybe the whole team since he's the captain in judge. Yeah, no, it's a good question. It, it's something I think it is new uh, in the past. It would be more me running into somebody in the, in the dining area or in the training room and kind of getting information from them there. I thought it would be a healthy exercise to, to do just what you just said, have the leader of the position players and the leader of the pitchers in the room with cash, with me, with Aaron, and just hear what concerns they have and, uh, you know, what their thoughts are on everything and what we could be doing better. Well, just to follow up, can you give us an idea? What 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 are they what what have they conveyed to you that you feel like you could be actionable on as as the owner of the team? Yeah, I don't really want to get into specifics, Joel, simply because it was a closed door meeting. And one of the things we agreed on is that whatever was spoken in that meeting would stay in that room. Um, so I really, as much as I don't want to not answer your question, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to on that one. But uh, believe when I tell you that everybody in the room understood because of that parameter that they were to say whatever's on their mind and, and really wanted to have a good, healthy once a month or so, you know, dialogue. You know, I want to ask you about the guy across town. Obviously, the Mets have an owner that's really uh, putting in quite a great effort, spending even more than you. You're right now the number two payroll. He's number one. Uh, you've been a supporter of his right from the start. I know there was some dissension there. There were a few owners that were against him, and they were, I guess, in, somewhat fearful that he was going to spend a lot of money, which he has done that. Uh, why did you support him? Do you still support him? Uh, because, you know, obviously it's a little more of a competition right now uh, across town. Yeah, and again, I, I focus on the teams in my division more than I do teams in the National League, as you know, but I get what you're saying. 
a lot of questions there. Why did I support him? I, I thought he would be good for New York baseball and to have two really good teams in New York and, and owners that are willing to, to put significant amounts of resources into those clubs. I mean, could only be good for New Yorkers. Um, that's one. Look, another owner pointed out, Steve's been playing by the rules. Nobody's broken any rules here. Um, do I agree with everything he's done? I am not a proponent that you can buy a championship. Not that he's trying to do that because they've got good young players too. But in general, speaking in general, I've said it more than once. I don't think you should have to have a $300 million. I'm up to 300 now. 10 years ago it was 200, $300 million <laughs> payroll to win a championship. The Astros didn't. No other team has. Um, you have to have a good mix of veterans, uh, you know, free agents, veterans, and, and young kids, which hopefully is something we're building upon with the likes of Peraza, Volpe, Cabrera. Um, I'm not sure if I answered all the questions here. <laughs> well, I I, 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 I'll follow up on a, a payroll question. You mentioned 300. It, it, it seemed in the offseason how that you were trying to go high, but not over that last number, the 293. I don't know if you're in, I know you're right near it. I don't know if your internal projections have you over it. Is that a limit for this team, or can you continue to add to that, especially as we start thinking towards the trade di- deadline in early August? Yeah, you know, even after I spoke to you guys, you know, before Christmas at the press conference after, the, we were working on a number of trades for weeks, and you know, there's no doubt some of those trades um, probably wouldn't have turned out that well. But some of the trades would have put us over. Uh, where, where are we at right now? We're right at it. Where I end up at the end of the year, if I don't spend a cent, as far as I'm concerned, I, I probably over it because we've had a lot of injuries. And as you know, bringing guys up from AAA, increased salaries, all that. Um, so, no, the 293 is not like an absolute threshold for me. No. You know, I want to ask you about your managing style, management style. Um, you were an adult when George, your father, was running the team and certainly probably deserving of the Hall of Fame. A lot of great qualities, but – you seem very different than him. I don't want to say opposite because, you know, I, that's really not fair. Did you purposely take the best of George and leave out the other? Or is it you're just being yourself and this is the way it is? Because obviously this is your first podcast. I can imagine if George were still in charge, he would have done a thousand podcasts by now and said a million things about every player on the team and the manager and all this. Uh, so you are obviously quite different, even if not the opposite. Um, is that intentional? Definitely not intentional. And I, John, you know enough people that know me well. I mean, I, I'm going to be who who I am. And there's going to be minuses with that, along with whatever pluses. Um, and I accept that. But I, I, I am, I'm going to be me. I mean, I, I find it very difficult to act uh, trying to be somebody else. And I'm just not going to do that. And, um, you know, we, we, we do have some things in common, but we, we definitely have some differences, too. I don't dwell on them and I don't try to, you know, emulate the, the good and, and discard the bad. No, I mean, I'm just I'm being me. I mean, that's just the way I am. Uh, you know, John mentioned maybe some uh, tendencies of your dad along the way uh, when he was doing it. I mean, I should say in the back half of his ownership, you were a very stable organization as far as uh, managers, GMs. And you certainly have kept that and you've kept Brian Cashman uh, since you came on. Brian takes an incredible amount of heat at especially on social media, about what he's doing. I wonder if you could give us, as the person who works closest with him, what do you continue to see in him that you want him running your baseball operations? Why do you keep bringing him back? What What do you see? I see a good leader, a good leader of his people who respect him greatly. Uh, and like me, he believes in balance. And I know we get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, noise about being too analytical, but there are numerous other teams, including the Rays, that are definitely more analytical than we are. Um, we both believe in a balance, which is why the, the Jim Hendrys of the world, the Tim Nairings, the Pro Scouts, bringing on Omar and Brian Sabian, um, listening to those guys every bit as much as we listen to the, to the, to the analytics guys and really trying to come up with a, a decision that everybody takes part in and that he and I consider every single word that's said. And that doesn't always work out. No, dis- not all decisions ever do in life, but I, I like his balance. He's he's willing to be balanced. Uh, other GMs might not be so. Um, and we've got a good relationship and we're not afraid to uh, say hard things to each other. And, uh, in a, you know, in a healthy, productive way. Aaron Boone has a great winning percentage in the regular season. And obviously you've had some disappointments in the postseason. Uh how would you evaluate Boone? It seems like Cashman is a huge supporter of his. He got a three-year deal recently, so I, I'm going to assume that you you like him, but I thought I should ask. Yeah, and I remember talking about this, I guess, in November. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think, look, the most important thing, one of the most important things for me is he has the respect of the players. They want to play for him and they want to win for him. And if I saw that disappear, then then I make a change. Um, and I've talked to Aaron about this. Um, and people can say what they want to say about players not wanting to, that's just not true. They, they do. They want to play for him. They want to win for him. They respect him. I think he's a good leader of the players. He's a good communicator. Um, I could take any manager and, and look at 100 decisions he made during the game, and I'm sure there's a ton I won't agree with. Um, but he does a good job, just like Cash does, and I think I do, of not just taking the analytics, but also, you know, employing some common sense and, you know, listening to the bench coach and, uh, you know, being somewhat balanced. Although, you know, in the dugout, analytics are obviously a big part of every team, you know, what, what's happening in there. Uh, you mentioned his name earlier, uh, Anthony Volpe. It was your big decision of spring training. Would he or wouldn't he jump from double A to be the starting shortstop of your ball club? Uh, he seems to be doing just fine, both uh, handling it emotionally and mentally, and more and more seems comfortable playing on both sides of the ball. I wonder what you you, you think of your shortstop. I think he's really come around hitting-wise now. I think the defense has been solid. Um, I thought it was going to be an extremely difficult decision. It turned out to be not so. I mean, it was almost unanimous with everybody that was in the uh, the room during that final meeting um, talking about him. And, um, you know, the right message was delivered to him. I, I said that with him before camp broke, and I told him, you are our starting shortstop for 2023. This is not a trial. Um, it's going to be that way through the ups and the potential downs. And... Uh, I got Jeter on the phone. Jeter was nice enough to talk to him for a little bit and give him some words of encouragement. So, um, it was a great meeting, but I wanted him to know, and I talked to his dad as well, that this 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 is it. You're the starting shortstop for the New York Yankees through through good and through bad, and we're gonna you know we're gonna stick with you if you do struggle. But I mean, for the most part, he's he's just done phenomenal. I'm gonna go back to something else, and that's George. Um, you know, he always said uh, that it, the season's a failure if you don't win the World Series. How do you look at it? I think it's harder to win the World Series now with all the different uh, layers of the playoffs. And you've won a lot of regular season games, but it's been since 2009 since you won. Uh, do you look at it that way? I, I've, always, I've always said our ultimate goal is to win a world championship. And if that doesn't happen, then we have failed in that goal. But no, I am not going to look at the season and say it, it was a failure. I'm not going to look at last year and look at the amount of games we won and say it was a failure, that we won a division series. I'm not going to say that's a failure. But in our ultimate goal, we clearly failed. Our ultimate goal every year is to win a world championship. And that's what we try to put a team together. And my family puts a lot of resources, you know, every year. I think we got a pretty good track record of trying to accomplish that. And if we don't accomplish that, then we did fail on that goal. Now you talk about resources. That doesn't make the whole season a failure. That's we differ in that. How you mentioned the resources. I think one of the things that's come up a lot, I think it's mainly about Aaron Hicks, but to some degree about Josh Donaldson also is would the Yankees ever move on from a player that they owe a lot of money to if uh, the belief was the 26-man roster would benefit from it? Are you someone willing to essentially take a giant snack on a contract if that is the advice of baseball operations? And maybe even ask the question, has baseball operations given you that advice yet on either of those players? Yeah, I'm not in the middle of the season, Joel. As usual, I, I don't I don't get into individual players and start start with the pluses and minuses. That would be fairly rare for me. Let's speak in generalities. Uh, if there's a decision to be made, and I feel that making that decision a certain way benefits us and gives us a better chance of winning a championship, then then money will rarely be be an issue. You know, this is probably the last question, but it's on my mind right now. And you know, you hear rumors about the team potentially being for sale at some point. <laughs> not so again. I ask you. Not I got, again. Gotta ask you. Gotta ask you. You holding on to the team? Are you, is there any chance you're going to sell the team? There's there's no discussion about selling the team. We have this is a multi generational effort at this point here at our Himes Complex, our player development complex in Tampa. I've got two of my nephews here that work full time now. My niece runs the Tampa Foundation with my sister, and uh, we, we've just uh, another nephew works over at Steinbrenner Field. So we we are invested as a family very much. Obviously, Jenny is involved, and Jesse. Uh, so, no, there are no talks and no plans. of, of So you're not getting rid of me yet, John. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder as a way to wrap up here, Hal, if I could ask just a big picture question a quarter of a season in here, which is what does the owner of the New York Yankees like most about his 2023 team and what concerns the owner of the Yankees most about his 2023 teams with three quarters of a season left? 
what I'm starting to like is what I've seen the last week. It's not only are we hitting, but more importantly, I think they truly believe now. And I'm, and maybe it's wrong to say they didn't a month ago, but it would have been harder to believe. They truly believe now that no matter what the score is, they're not out of the game. They can come back. And that's the way they were for, you know, the first half to two thirds of last year before all the injuries hit. Um, what I don't like about the team, there's really nothing to say. I mean, they're, they're a great group of guys. They communicate well. They hold each other accountable. Um, everything I see in the clubhouse is great. Uh, I don't like the injuries. We've already talked about that. Uh, and I don't like, I don't like, and this has been addressed. I don't like base running errors. I don't like mistakes, particularly when you're playing teams like the Rays where you cannot afford to give them outs and, and make mistakes. So that's, that's something we need to get better at the errors, the base running mistakes, uh, things of that kind. Um, but a lot of teams struggle with that and that's just, it has to be addressed and that's what we're doing. The Yankees' most famous player ever, Babe Ruth, he obviously had a lot of legends with the Yankees, and I think Judge and Cole are two of the best players. We talked about this. We're going to talk about this on the show, but two of the ten best players in the game. But uh, there's another player who's been compared to Babe Ruth who's playing right now. I'm just wondering what you think of Otani. Well, I mean, obviously a very, very, very special uh, young man. I mean, to to be able to do what he can do, I mean, it's just that I don't think there's a major league baseball player that doesn't say, wow. And, you know, if they're saying, wow, then all of us should be saying, wow, uh, just a, just a great player. Uh, Hal, uh, we'll wrap up with this. Uh, can the 2023 Yankees win the world series and why will the 2023 Yankees win? Can, the world can series? you, like, I, I assume you understand. Yeah. Well, we know there's a lot yeah. of lanes. The team yeah. you're watching can, can it accomplish what the, team hasn't accomplished since 2009, which is even get there. And if so, yeah. what, why? What What is it about this team that, that you see as championship caliber? Well, we have to get healthier. I mean, if we if we went in right now as is, I think it would be a struggle, Joe. I'll be the first one to say that. Uh, not that I don't have confidence in them, but we are, we are depleted right now. Most teams are to a certain extent, but, you know, I what could get us, what could get us over the hump? Getting guys back. I really felt that getting Rodon in the offseason was going to be a game changer for us. Um, particularly since we're going to assume, of course, as always, that we'll be playing uh, our nemesis, the Astros, at some point. <laughs> I'll be at ALCS, and uh, I just felt we need another top-of-the-rotation starter, and that's why we went and got him. I think he's somebody, and he will get healthy, somebody that could really make a difference in that endeavor at that time. So no regrets on the Rodon contract, uh, a quarter into a six-season contract? No, no, re no regrets whatsoever. And again, I see him here. I see him here almost every day. He's at Himes. He wants to be in New York. He wants to be pitching. He wants to be contributing. Um, so we will we will see how that goes. But we believe he's moving in the right direction. But no, no regrets whatsoever. He's going to be great. L last question, important question. How how'd your first podcast go, Hal? <laughs> I think it, it went great. I mean, it was easier than I thought. I mean, I do Zoom calls all the time. I I kind of thought there'd be more to it than that. But this is easy. <laughs> you you talk about without a, this time next time without a slam. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was a rip or a compliment. But yeah, we'll I was about it. to say is <laughs> a lot of older players lose their fastball. I think he just suggested we lost ours, John. We've gone yeah. soft. We're soft. <laughs> uh, Hal, uh, we do. We know you're playing hurt. You're wearing the sling. We know you have to see your surgeon today. Four weeks after your uh, your shoulder surgery, we, we do appreciate you uh, joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hamer. All right, guys. John, have a good vacation. What's left of it? <laughs> Thanks, Hal. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. John, usually at this time of our show to close, we play hit or error, but I think it was just a hit, uh, the the uh, interview with Hal Steinbrenner. I thought it was very both interesting and revelatory. We, it hadn't been public that uh, he got Derek Jeter on the phone to talk with Anthony Volpe uh, to brace him for what was coming this season as the rookie shortstop of the Yankees. He had not mentioned publicly, no one had before, that he now meets once a month with the two leaders of his team in person, Garrett Cole and Aaron Judge. He went a lot of places, John. What did what, you think of this? Yeah, I thought he was great. I give him an A for his first podcast, which was something new. I didn't know this was his first ever podcast, so we're honored about that. Uh, you know, he's obviously a great speaker. I don't, he should probably do more, but I'm not encouraging him to do the competition. I, I, you know, I thought he was good on everything. I thought it was interesting why he, he supported Steve Cohn. He's interested in New York baseball being great, and uh I thought that was a, a nice highlight. Uh, there were many, many highlights. He's obviously not selling the team. He didn't love that question, but we always have to ask since he, you know, he doesn't appear that often. Uh, and you hear rumors all the time. I thought the judge stuff was interesting, uh, how they got to the 360. And, 
I thought he did. He was terrific. So I'm glad that we got him. And uh, let's make it a plan to get him once a year. Yeah. You know, John, if if there's room in New York for me and you to do a podcast, work at the same at two different <laughs> places together and stay friends for 35 years, then we are there's room in New York for uh, six million fans to come see the Mets, uh, the, the Steve Cohen Mets and the Hal Steinbrenner Yankees. I'll, I'll say this is I, it's something I think you kind of alluded to there, which him talking, I just think he's become more comfortable in this job as time has gone by and more observant. At the end, when he talked about observing Carlos Rodon and getting a feeling that the player badly wants to be healthy and help this team because he's working out in Tampa mm -hmm. and Hal gets to see it. I think it's a sign like, cause one of the things you hear complaint wise about Hal from fans in particular is how much does he care? And I think when he provides an answer like that, it suggests that he's observing and he does care. Yeah, and he's at the games. I mean, he seems not to be out there as George would be. And uh, that's why I always ask him when I talk to him, how, how are you George's son? How are you like a complete opposite? Uh, although I try to do it nicer than that. And, uh, you know, he was there as an adult observing George. And obviously there were a lot of great qualities to the boss, but there were some negative qualities. And, you know, I think I do think people should appreciate the fact that, and you, you mentioned that there was stability in the in the lat latter part of George's tenure, but there is complete stability with Hal, and uh, I think the employees certainly appreciate that, and uh, to a degree we do, and probably the fans should as well. Yeah, uh, again, I, I I think that he uh, is by training an MBA uh, pilot. Uh, you, we know this. He tracks the weather mercilessly because I think, again, the pilot thing, I think he likes to take information and work slowly from information. And his father was very much a gut level owner where he is very much a thoughtful owner. Yeah. I mean, part of that, the times have changed. But it, obviously, uh, you know, I, we didn't have analytics for most of George's tenure. But, uh, you know, obviously these personalities are, are very, very different. And it's just interesting to observe that. Uh you know, I'm 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 getting to know Hal. Took a, taking a little bit longer. George, uh, I can remember. I think I I got on the beat uh, within a week. Uh, we went out uh, to the 21 Club. I'm sure you were there. And he he uh, he uh, he said that there was no chance that he would be firing Bucky Dent this whole year. Right? He was going to get the whole year, and then he 50 games in, he was gone. So it's 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 like a complete opposite. But uh, you know, I think right now I'm feeling it's a good opposite. Yeah, I was there, Joe, and it feels like yesterday <laughs> was 33 years ago. Hard, hard to believe. You know, it does take uh, different personalities. We're very different personality types. You're type A and I'm type A+. plus. So it's uh, <laughs> it works. Uh, as usual. That's the, that's the first A+, plus you ever got, by the way. Yes. If you saw my actual school marks, it's why I'm doing <laughs> a podcast with John and not actually something creative and good with my No, mind. you did okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening to the uh, show, a podcast from the New York Post. We always appreciate how much work Andrew Hartz and Jake Brown put into this to produce the show week after week. The show drops every Wednesday about noon on the Yes app. Don't forget to give us a view, not just a listen. Uh, subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please give us a five-star rating. And please spend the season traveling with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayden.